Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Nasaan man po kayo sa parte ng mundo? Welcome to our 78th installment of the Stop COVID Deaths webinar series brought to you by the University of the Philippines. As you know, we are still in the seventh season po, no? pero malapit na rin po and fast approaching ang ating new season. So uh, we hope that uh, that's something that you'll also be looking forward to. We are very, very lucky that each and every one of you continue to join us week in and week out. And for those who are joining us for the very first time and who have just discovered us for today, Welcome po and I'm sure sana po magustuhan po ninyo ang ating uh, mga topics for these webinars. As new spikes in cases are seen in the United Kingdom and in Singapore and despite the, this despite the high levels of vaccination, our attention is drawn to how we can survive the continuing ups and downs uh, brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Sa sentro po ng ating pong response, nandito po ang ating mga healthcare facilities o ang ating mga hospital. And throughout the pandemic, persons with other illnesses that are not related to COVID-19 suffered from delays in consultation, sa kanilang pagpapagamot, sa kanilang pagpapaopera. Uh, meron pong mga talagang mahabang listahan uh, kung paano po na puwersa ng pandemya po para po tayo lahat ay makapag-rethink uh, kung paano po ang gagawin po natin long term, paano po ba natin mas maseserbisyohan ng mas maigi ang ating mga pasyente, lalo na po yung mga may uh, infections po without uh, compromising or sacrificing other types of medical care na nabib na nabibigay po natin bilang hospital bago po yung pandemya. At, at ito rin po ay desperately needed by our other patients. So if you want to learn the latest on COVID-19 design interventions straight, From the most credible experts, please stay tuned. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Director of the National Telehealth Center, National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. Always a pleasure to be with all of you during our regular Friday lunch date. And I always look forward to Fridays uh, because, as you know, I get to share hosting duties with the Special Envoy of the President for Global Health Initiatives, our adjunct research faculty at the National Telehealth Center, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susie? Oh. Hi Raymond, uh, good afternoon. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. San man kayo naroon, I hope you're doing well. Uh, I think um, nobody knows what's going to happen with this pandemic. No, Parang yung ibang bansa nagbukas na, tapos ngayon naghigpit na naman. So magandang ano, yung mga hospital natin, meron silang plano at meron silang mga pagbabagong ginagawa para tumuloy man itong COVID, sana naman hindi, di ba? Pero kung tumuloy man yung COVID, handa tayo, no? So today, we will talk about uh, design, no? Uh, hospital design. And I know that there are a lot of you who are watching from the hospitals because you've got great, great speakers. And um, this is an opportunity for us to think about how do we organize the space where we're working, kung saan tayo nag, nag, ano, no, nagbibigay ng servisyo. So, abangan niyo po, maganda pong pag-uusapan natin ngayon. Over to you, Raymond. Thank you so much, Dr. Susie. And for those, gaya po na nasabi ko, for those who are joining us for the very first time, we usually have um, a very brief video prepared by TVUP. Ito po yung tinatawag po nating mga interviews or person on the street interviews po natin. For our interview video for today, Uh, we have asked as well several um, respondents po ang mga uh, uh, katanungang ito. Ano po ang intindi ninyo sa green design? Ano po sa tingin ninyo ang kailangan para tayo pong lahat ay maging pandemic ready? Ito po ay uh, uh, in addition na po sa ating minimum public health standards. Ano po ba ang mga epekto ng mga disenyo ng mga gusali sa ating kalusugan para maging pandemic ready? Uh, so please watch this. Kailangan natin para maging pandemic ready talaga yung pondo eh. Dapat ready lagi yung pondo sa kamay mga konsta, uh, may mga nakaready na tayo na mga facility o konkretong plano kung sakaling kung anong pandemya man yung dadapo. On a personal level siguro dapat pinaghahandaan natin by getting enough sleep, exercising, eating nutritious food, ganun. Pero on a societal level siguro dapat mayroong systems in place para maging pandemic ready. Personal health natin, kumbaga, uh, uh, we must always strive to stay healthy, to stay fit, ayusin yung mga kinakain natin, uh, lalo na sa 
mga office workers. Ginagamit yung mga eco-friendly na mga materyales. Uh, katulad ng mga yung mga kahoy o yung mga locally made. Merong approach sa construction na may sustainability or eco-friendly na materials na ginagamit kasi kinoconsider na yung mga taong gagamit noon dapat safe from hazardous effects nung construction. Pag-design ng ating mga buildings or pag-design ng mga structures natin uh, with the thought of lessing our carbon footprint in constructing or and uh, and at uh, gayon din yung uh, how to design buildings para makatulong sa ating environment pati rin sa health ng mga uh, tao pag nasa opisina ka or nasa nasa mall or kahit saan important na maganda yung circulation ng air yung maaliwalas nakakahinga ka kasi syempre tong tong covid dapat 'di ba hindi ka naka-confine sa isang space kasi mabilis makahawa bukod dun sa mga gagamitin sa mga gagamitin dapat yung mga construction natin na mga itatayo eh prepared na rin sana sa ano sa mga sa mga, mga kwarto for isolation na ready ready yung mga provision para sa electrical o kung anong gagamitin doon uh, a big difference in Uh, space planning uh, more on technologies na makakatulong sa atin of less contact and better ventilation of air and sunlight sa ating mga buildings yung tingin ko eh wala naman din natin alam kung uh, kailan yan dadating yung pandemic eh. siguro yun na lang din kung may dadating na ganito pa klase ng pandemic uh, sumunod sumunod sa mga instruction sa mga sa mga guidelines yung mga protective measure natin para maprotektahan natin sarili natin. Okay, thank you very much TVUP. It's always very uh very interesting to see what uh persons on the street are thinking. And uh, nakakatuwa no kasi pinag-uusapan nila yung ventilation, no? Dapat meron tayong open space, no? Mas maraming sunlight and ito ay siguro isang layunin ng mga arkitekto natin. Mamaya meron tayong architect who's going to talk about Uh, green design kasi hindi lang naman yung covid no pati yung pandemya pero yung pandemya I, i mean pat, hindi lang yung covid pati na rin yung climate change pero hindi lang yung ano hindi lang yung uh, yung yung uh, design no uh, later we will talk about the PGH one word concept so pag uh, ipipresent yan at uh, pag-uusapan yan pero hindi lang yung physical space kasama din yan yung network paano nakikipag-ugnay ang isang hospital sa mga secondary at primary facilities. And I know you're all very interested in this kasi as frontliners, laging nasa isip natin yan eh, di ba? Yung referral, yung sistema. So maganda ngayon, mga pag-uusapan natin to at natutuwa naman ako yung ating mga persons on the street. Eh naiisip na rin nila yon naiisip na nila. So tama-tama lang. Okay, over to you Raymond. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Susie. Very interesting ang ating uh, mga inputs. Uh, lalo na po, uh, mukhang uh, from the youth sector ang mga nag-respond po sa ating person on the street uh, interviews. Uh, just a reminder po that our webinar is able to accommodate a maximum of 3,000 participants. We are now numbering a little less 700 in the Zoom. But we all know, uh, marami po sa inyo ang nag-join po kasama sa atin sa YouTube channel ng TVUP, pati na rin po sa Facebook pages ng Stop COVID Deaths ng University of the Philippines at ng TVUP. So, sana po kung maaari po kayong makabog join po sa atin, lalo sa Zoom, for you to be able to get the full experience, please uh, join as soon as possible. And for you, if you could also um, hikayatin ang inyong mga kaibigan, kamag-anak, mga katrabaho, na mag-join uh, po sa ating webinar For today. Very, very interesting po ang ating topic at ang ating mga experts uh, in our panel. Uh, they will be uh, sharing nuggets of wisdom in preparation or at least for making uh, the healthcare facilities pandemic ready. Uh, we, I would like to enjoin every one of you to also put in sa ating Q&A boxes and maybe if you are outside of Zoom sa YouTube chat, chat po o sa Facebook po sa so may comment section. 
uh, if you have any questions uh, that you want to ask, uh, if you have prepared beforehand, please uh, go ahead and enter them. And then finally, uh, meron po tayong fun quiz. Uh, ito po sa Zoom poll or sa Mentimeter for those who are not able to join us uh, in the Zoom. Please go well, open your internet browsers and please type www.menti.com and enter the code 17231665. That's 17231665 for you to be able to join in our fun quiz. For those who are asking, certificates of attendance will be given to those who have at least watched 50% of the webinar duration po. No? Ito po ang itsura ng, electronic, uh, ng e-certificate na maibibigay po natin. We have uh, distributed uh, for the last 76 webinars. I think there are still those that we are still um, distributing for webinar 77. Uh, so we hope that those who still have not received at least for webinar 76 pababa ay masabihan po kami. Uh, lalo po sa aming mga email, we, uh, there, there's staff that uh, counter-checks po sa ating database yung inyong mga requests for certificates. Over to you, Dr. Susie. Yeah, thank you very much, Raymond. And I just wanted to greet RJ who said that this is his 30th. <laughs> 30th webinar, no? Nakakatuwa naman. Tsaka batiin natin yung mga, uh, those who are watching us outside of the country, but I'd like to greet all those who are watching from Manila Doctors Hospital. It seems like we have a number from Manila Doctors Hospital. We've got a number from uh, Southern Philippines Medical Center, SPMC in Davao. And nako, hindi ko ma-name lahat. No? Mamaya, in-name ni, ni, ni uh, Raymond. Pero we're just so happy that you're here kasi kung hindi sa inyo, wala kami rito. And um, it's great to be with you on, on a Friday. Okay, so Raymond, uh, time to go to the opening remarks. Ikaw ba ang opening? Palagay ko yes. na siya. <laughs> yes. Okay, Thank go. you, Dr. Susie. Uh, but before I start with uh, just a brief opening remarks, uh, I just wanted to let the audience know that we are following our standard panel discussion format, which means we have a main speaker who will be presenting, followed by a set of reactions from our two other experts uh, from the panel. This will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, and questions will be entertained. Kung saan man po kayo mag-enter, sa Zoom, sa Facebook, sa YouTube, uh, may mga pipiliin din po mga katanungan po doon. Uh, kung kayo man po, kung kayo po ay nasa Zoom at mapili po kayo na uh, mag-request mag -re po kami na mag-open po kayo ng video or maybe join us in the panel for you to be able to ask your questions live to any of our three uh, panelists, uh, we hope you'll be able to um, grant us this request. So maraming salamat po. For this webinar, we will be talking about really how hospital design is a critical element to making sure that uh, well the institution in this case the healthcare facility is ready for any outbreak any pandemic na uh, tatama tatama po dito as mentioned po doon sa aking introduction um, tayo po ay nakapag-survive na po ng mga ups and downs brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, pero and napag-usapan na rin po natin sa mga past webinars how hospitals have been really restructuring, redesigning their spaces. Pero ano po ba yung mga specifics po noon? Ano po ba? How does one hospital effectively organize its space, uh, lalo na po sa mga lugar na medyo limited po ang mga resources, uh, have sparse resources to achieve its uh, mission? Uh, paano po ba lumalabas ang inherent creativity, innovations, new ideas, and how all of those that are, well, uh, sabihin na natin, uh, being considered as uh, sort of uh, new age or uh, uh, innovative ideas really become part of the mainstream protocol for hospitals. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Susie, we will be exploring, particularly for the Philippine General Hospital, the one word concept to be able to contain the COVID-19 uh, uh, disease as well as enabling also other services to continue. So our design, not merely architectural in nature, but has an emphasis on linking up uh, paano po ba yung mga serbisyo na pwedeng ma-provide sa isang hospital, gaya po ng Philippine General Hospital, ay maigi po na parte po ito na isang tinatawag na service delivery network so that uh, all of the services for that particular patient 
is accessible. So please uh, stay tuned and we hope uh, more and more of those who have registered will be able to join us for today's webinar. Over to you, Dr. Susie. Okay, thank you very much, Raymond, for setting the tone for our discussion today. Aside from PGH, we will be uh, listening to the director of uh, St. Luke's Medical Center in uh, Global, St. Luke's Global. And we have uh, an architect from Green Architects Philippines who will be speaking to us about, about design. Okay, so uh, without further ado, Ama ba yun? O may mentimeter muna tayo? I, th I think we have a fun poll ah, muna, Dr. Susie. Okay. okay. Na-throw na off ako doon kasi ikaw <laughs> na okay, No problem, so, Dr. Bago Susie. Tayo mag, ano, bago tayo mag, mag... Bago natin punta ng ating main presenter, uh, we have a fun quiz for you. O game, Raymond, ikaw na yan. Okay, we have two questions po as mentioned. Uh, these questions po really, uh, hindi po siya required, pero we hope you'll be able to, jo to join us for this um, fun quiz, uh, just to be able to gauge ano po ang alam po ninyo. And then afterwards, ano po ba ang natutunan po ninyo sa ating webinar? For our very first question in today's webinar, what should hospitals do to prepare for pandemics? Option A, have effective and accessible leadership. Option B, constant review and revision of infection control and prevention protocols. Option C, restructuring of the healthcare worker staff. Option D, infrastructure redesign and restructuring. Or option E, lahat po ng nabanggit. So we are seeing in the Zoom po, to less than two, well, more than 250 na po ang nag-respond uh, uh, sa ating Zoom. And then for our menti, meron na pong 73 respondents po. So we hope ma mas marami pa po ang mag-join sa ating fun quiz. We also like to greet those who are joining us uh, locally from the United Architects of the Philippines in Quezon City, from the Climate Change Commission in San Miguel in Manila, Palawan State University Student Nurses Association in Puerto Princesa in Palawan, Albay Doctors Hospital, Legazpi City, Albay, the National Economic and Development Authority Region 6 Office in Iloilo City, and the Local Government Unit of General Santos, City in South Cotabato. For question number two, our question states, ano-ano po ba ang mga health facilities na pwedeng makatugon sa krisis ng pandemya? Multiple choice po ito. Uh, option A, hospital. Option B, health center. Option uh, C, quarantine facilities. Option D, sa bahay. Option uh, E, hotel. Uh, option F, uh, unoccupied buildings. And then lastly, all of the above. So, uh, patuloy nyo lang pong uh, sagutan. Uh, Mag-join po kayo sa ating fun quiz. Uh, we'd also like to greet those joining us internationally all the way from Chonin Hospital in Taipei, Taiwan, Nguyen Thai Hong Poly Polyclinic in Vietnam, from Penang, Malaysia, from Lunichi Ali University of Blida to Algeria, from Dubai, United Arab Emirates, the University of, of Ha'il in Saudi Arabia, University of Fiji, Lautoka, Fiji, Morningside Nursing and Rehab Center, Bronx, New York. And then finally, from Zurich, Switzerland. So maraming maraming salamat po. We all know uh, it's a bit of a sacrifice. Uh, iba po ang inyong time zone. At uh, we hope this is something that will be useful for you in your work and uh, really uh, in your administrative roles po. So we won't be closing this fun poll and, uh, just yet as we move on to the introduction of our main speaker. Ang cute, Raymond. No, nakikutan talaga ako dyan sa, <laughs> sa, sa graphic na yan. Nakakatuwa. Okay. So, maraming salamat sa lahat ng mga nakikinig. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about mga crisis, no? Pag mayroong problema. Pero ito naman, dapat pinaghahandaan natin, eh, no? Pinaghahandaan natin kung uh, ano man ang mangyari. Sabi nga natin, wala nang nakakaalam kung kailan ito matatapos. So, mas mabuti na handa tayo. Mabuti na yung meron tayong... Meron tayong ano kumbaga ano vision, di ba na kung sakasakaling magtagal pa ito, alam natin kung ano gagawin natin. Okay. So ngayon, uh, it's it's my my honor, my privilege to introduce our speaker. Paborito niyo siya, alam ko. And uh, he's been on the on the webinar many times already and we're just very grateful na meron siyang pagkakataon na pinaunlakan tayo na mag mag-present, mag-share ng uh, PGH1 ward uh, concept or system and um, we're our country is very fortunate 
that we have somebody in the Philippine General Hospital who's leading the Philippine General Hospital who's very stable, very reliable, and very credible. And alam natin na ano, hindi natutulog to eh. Isa pang hindi natutulog. Pero kahit hindi natutulog to, memoryado niya lahat ng nangyayari dyan sa PGH. Let's welcome Dr. Uh, Gap Legaspi, Dr. Gerardo Legaspi, the um, director of the UPPGH uh, Hospital. Gap, Dr. hello. Good afternoon, Susie. Raymond, good afternoon. afternoon I'm sir. happy to be here again. Uh, Namimiss ko na kaya, ano, kaya excited ako nga uh, makasama kayo. Matagal-tagal oh. na rin yung uh, pang-apat kong ba appearance. Ganun. Oh, eh, alam namin busy ka eh. Kaya, ano, parang, anong tawag ito, iniipon namin kung talagang, <laughs> ilan talaga. So, Gap, welcome. And uh, we are very, uh, we, we are we're really very happy to hear about what you're doing, what your vision is. Anong paghahanda ang ginagawa natin? And I uh, just wanted to let you know that there are many hospitals that are watching right now. So I think, ano, ano, parang maganda may learning tayo. Sige, Gap, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I may share my screen. Uh, magandang hapot po sa inyo lahat. Uh, Ang uh, dalawang party po itong uh, aking uh, discussion ngayong hapon, uh, isa ito ko sa eksperyensya ng uh, PGH sa mga infrastruktura sa hospital na naging uh, challenge sa aming lahat nung nag-umpisa ang pandemya dahil wala naman po nagbalak na magka-pandemya at uh, maghanda doon. Uh, the last one uh, we had, I think, was in 1928. It was a huge typhoid outbreak here in Manila. But... Uh, after that was the war that was the wars that uh, happened so uh, we have been uh, fortunate to have been um, supported um, uh, by a lot of agencies and i uh, would just like to probably uh, thank everyone uh, at this point for that and as we uh, hopefully reel away from the uh, heavy load of covid we start uh, going back and look at the lessons that we've learned and i thought to, uh, in in preparation for the future from here on it will be good to uh, look back as we have already done with our procedures, our medications, our protocols. It's now to a real, a hard um, um, factor, a concrete factor in uh, handling a hospital responding to a pandemic, which is the infrastructure. Uh, ang PJH po ay 114 years old. Na natayo siya noong 1910. At ang design niya ay parang... Uh, uh, dinisenyo para sa isang tropical country, matataas ang kisame, halos 15 feet po, malalaki ang mga bintana, uh, pero at puro natural ventilation. But through the years, you know, the uh, demands of uh, of uh, patient uh, care uh, have made it really congested, even if it was big. Uh, but fortunately, the corridors remain with high ceiling. No? So uh, when, when we closed uh, to be a COVID referral center in the uh, uh, March of 20, almost one uh, one year and 20, uh, 20 months ago, no, one year and eight months ago. Uh, uh, marami pong nangyari na, na, uh, na gusto nating balikan ngayong, ngayong hapon para matutunan at magamit ang kaalaman nito para uh, mas maganda ang ating uh, pagresponde kung meron man sa susunod na pandemia o kaya ang ating pag-aalaga sa mga pasyente sa kasalukuyang pandemia. Uh, pwede pa tayong gumawa ng mga, uh, mga adjustments sa ating mga kinalalagyan. Kami po yung nakakita na ng mahigit 7,000 pasyente at sa ngayon po ay uh, bumababa ang numero nang galing po ito sa 330, 326 na pinakamataas at ngayon po ay nasa kahapon ay 96 sa mga COVID patients dito. Ang aming pong healthcare workers ay tangkaroon ng positive test uh, in 1,823 at um, Lagi po namin sinasabi, ironically, ang pinaka-counting infection ay doon sa mga direct na nagtatrabaho sa COVID ward. Maari may dahilan po dito. No? Um, sila marahil ang pinaka-maingat dahil uh, alam nilang directo silang mahawak ng mga pasyente may COVID at ang, at ang idea na ma-infect sila ay laging sariwa sa kanilang isip at sila ay uh, laging nagbab nagbabantay sa sarili nila. No? O kaya naman, baka dahil na yung aming mga COVID wards ay mga modified na wards based on, on ventilation and uh, health protocols as well. No? Baka mas mababa nga ang chance na makakuha ng, ng, uh, 
ng uh, infection doon at ito ay napatunayan no, na si Dr. Berba ay gumawa ng mga swab test hindi na mga pasyente kundi mga surfaces sa aming COVID ward at wala pong tumubo na virus kundi sa toilet seat uh, sa kubeta. So I guess that's a very interesting finding no? um, uh, that probably shows us what uh, factors could play, come into play wherein the virus doesn't uh, stay put in one place. It, it's probably dissipated right away by proper ventilation. That's just a theory on our part that we need to uh, um, prove. Uh, so through the, through the months, we have... Uh, had uh, people do, doing our uh, operations, both scientifically and uh, manually at that, our COVID crisis team may, being mainly surgeons, uh, led by uh, Dr. Ocampo, uh, our infection control unit led by Dr. Berba. No? Um, the manpower management was staggering. Um, at one point, we were housing 1,800 employees in uh, 15 hotels, 10 schools, uh, and religious dormitories and Dr. Um, um, Rodin Dofitas um, ably handled the different uh, personalities, the different needs uh, and the different uh, uh, personal crisis that uh, we went through um, handling uh, manpower. Uh, and our um, now director of St. Luke's Medical City and Global City handled uh, very efficiently and methodically our logistics. No? Uh, I think by now we should have spent around 2 billion pesos um, for the whole COVID um, uh, operations and um, uh, getting the supplies, our food donations, uh, our PPEs was Dr. Serrano, Dennis Serrano's job. And of course, uh, making sure that the constructions needed were done uh, properly. So in those constructions, um, going back to them, as I, as I uh, was preparing for this lecture, I thought, uh, you know, um, basic principles uh, involving different areas of uh, need for infrastructure could be better discussed and actual details of these uh, constructions. So uh, I think looking back, uh, if a hospital is going to be to re respond to a pandemic uh, like COVID-19, um, uh, special attention or more attention should be given to ventilation, um, use of space, and, and making sure that more open space is available should be considered granting also the, the uh, 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 small areas that hospitals are built in now because of the cost of uh, land uh, where they have built. And of course, um, uh, the isolation of uh, patients and healthcare workers has been a big reality that we had to uh, take care of and uh, with much difficulty also at the start. And in the long um, uh, uh, course of COVID, this COVID-19 infection has been um, with us. We realize also that we cannot just, um, that we eventually make the hospital our uh, home, uh, second home, and that we have to have refuge areas for our healthcare workers that will uh, uh, hopefully dissipate the uh, anxiety, the stress, the fatigue, or maybe the longingness um, of home, uh, even if they're, when they're in the hospital. And, and all of this, all of these uh, uh, changes should be scalable, meaning you can increase them at a given notice and you can decrease them when the time uh, comes that uh, more other services are uh, needed to be um, mobilized. So um, I'll just concentrate probably uh, our experience on these four areas and start with the most important is ventilation. As I said, PGH is a non-air conditioned uh, uh, facility with high ceiling and big windows. So uh, uh, we had seven days to prepare the ventilation of the wards. No? So I think uh, our friends um, who owned, uh, who knew the, the uh, owners of factories of uh, exhaust fans knocked on the doors of these owners and asked to supply us with almost 250 uh, exhaust fans that we needed for the awards. No? Uh, architect Dan Lichauco and Amani Minyana came uh, with engineers uh, to help us uh, uh, study the airflow design that will allow us to optimize um, the uh, uh, direction and the wind uh, flow uh, velocity uh, that passes through the awards, these big awards. No? And uh, our friends from DMCI, Hillmarks Construction, and of course our engineering uh, personnel here 
all uh, uh, put together their effort to uh, install these fans in uh, less, less than a week's time. No? So the principle behind that is um, what we call uh, natural uh, airflow, uh, na natural wind-directed natural airflow, wherein um, uh, we blow in wind air to one side, uh, causing a negative pressure effect that uh, pushes it to the other side or upwards, uh, which we facilitate with electric fans. So these are the various um, illustrations that I kept, we kept um, to illustrate the uh, flow of um, uh, air away from patients and away from healthcare workers uh, in uh, different areas of the hospital. So the unidirectional natural airflow was uh, facilitated by installing these fans that sucked in air from the outside, fresh air, and then eventually blew it out with the uh, fans on the other side that will blow off the air to an empty garden in the middle. So um, if I may demonstrate that, so we, to facilitate air from the front of the pavilion, we, we put installed large fans to blow in the um, uh, air from uh, the front and then the different exhaust fans to uh, 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 facilitate the flow from outside into the wards here and uh, exhaust fans that facilitated blowing it to the inner garden uh, inside, which uh, gave us a unidirectional flow of air into the garden. So we estimated that we should, using uh, uh, air um, uh, wind vanes uh, that the air exchange around six to eight uh, uh, exchanges per, per hour. So this is the, these are the exhaust fans mounted on the windows of uh, the guards uh, sucking in here and pushing out here. Uh, this is the positive uh, fan going out. So into the garden there. So for us to know if we are uh, effective, we put these uh, slips of tissue paper um, to uh, always check that the flow of air is towards the garden area. So, so it shows that, and from uh, outside, uh, we were blowing fans also as indicated by this um, uh, strip of tissue paper, uh, giving us an idea that almost all the time, wind flow uh, through the wards is adequately uh, provided. So uh, we have used this uh, system since uh, March of the last year. It's still operational till now. And uh, we're happy to note, as I said, that the infection rate in the COVID ward is 0.3% uh, as estimated by our HIKU. Uh, coming from patients to our uh, personnel. So the other uh, factor that we need to put uh, employ uh, in planning for the future responses to pandemic is open space. I think this has been a big problem of all hospitals when they found themselves overwhelmed with patients, not only patients, but equipment, uh, supplies, you know, food donations, and uh, there's no place to put them. And uh, it became a problem for um, uh, those running the uh, operations on um, waste stage and spoilage uh, at that. So I think um, uh, we've been, uh, PGS is fortunate enough to have a lot of this space and we were able to uh, uh, mobilize, uh, utilize them to our big advantage. Uh, uh, we had spaces in front, on the sides, at the back, you know, and inside the hospital itself. And one of them is the uh, atrium that we built right before the pandemic uh, opened uh, August of 20, 2019. It was supposed to be a gathering place, a happening place, and it, in fact was inaugurated with the UP Symphony Orchestra on, uh, playing there during our foundation day. But it turned out to be a, uh, again, a, uh, a, uh, a jump off point for a lot of our operations from uh, launching our bike, uh, uh, parking our bikes uh, early on in the pandemic for our uh, uh, healthcare workers, accepting the uh, hundreds of thousands of PPEs that we had to stock uh, to give every month um, and donations from elsewhere, uh, everywhere coming in, uh, including beds that we have to uh, 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 prepare for deployment to the wards. So, so a big area is always needed for uh, a big operation and um, this is a, a, a well uh, protected area from the sun and uh, from rain also. So I guess in planning the future, we should not overlook uh, uh, that need. But of course, it also turned out uh, handy when we decided to have a Christmas celebration at the, uh, in the uh, 
peak of the pandemic uh, in December of December last year, and even hosted the homecoming of class 1995. So um, this also, of course, allowed us to have some uh, uh, camaraderie uh, and uh, cordial activities even for a night. And of course, and one of the biggest use for the, our uh, uh, open space, which is the atrium, is a vaccination uh, program. So uh, we were able to accommodate at a given time 400 to 500 people because of the size of the facility. So a third um, uh, need that we had to do was to isolate uh, patients and our healthcare workers, and it was really makeshift at the start. No, uh, I think everyone did this plastic and wood uh, enclosure. Uh, uh, I'm happy to tell you now that this is all aluminum and glass with uh, uh, sturdy uh, air conditioning and um, ventilation uh, systems. No? Uh, as a response to a long-term need for COVID uh, to be isolated, we built a 42-bed, uh, 11 ICU-capable uh, in isolation ward, which is now ideal uh, uh, in ventilation, uh, since we're going to build a new one anyway, for negative pressure uh, 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 direction, uh, negative pressure ventilation, uh, wherein the air is uh, filtered um, and also UV treated as, as it leaves the uh, exhaust uh, in, on the roof. So uh, we decided to put up a, uh, an isolation complex in preparation for the, that time wherein COVID can be our COVID patients, uh, numbering maybe 42 or less, as we have experienced in the past, it was possible to be uh, put in an area separate from the um, main pavilions, making the pavilions COVID free. So I, I, you know, we very well know how much the presence of COVID patients disrupts flow and uh, processes um, inside an area. No? So I think um, it's a good uh, a move um, on our part to be able to uh, uh, build this uh, isolation complex. Um, and it was a, another uh, effort that was uh, Bayanihan in nature being a jointly funded by private government and government agencies. So the idea there is that we have uh, separate isolations, so each one with an independent ventilation. So uh, no air mixes between the compartments. Uh, I see you here um, with a, a more uh, uh, oxygen and gas piping lines. But I think one important factor here is that you have an air pocket completely separate from the corridors and the wards wherein patients, uh, healthcare workers or doctors needing to uh, ev uh, evaluate patients uh, can do so through windows in the walls of this, uh, of this air pocket without donning PPEs. So uh, we went even, uh, we're going even a step further. The, the new respirators are buying and they have arrived, I think, are now can now be remotely controlled from this station. So, uh, we learned um, that through our wards with the glass partitions that, that you can actually also effectively manage patients through windows um, um, and through a remote uh, communication. So this is the interior of that uh, COVID ward. Uh, we made sure also that the design was homey so that patients are more comfortable inside. Uh, and I'd like to thank Dr. Serrano for giving us um, the beds in this um, uh, facility. Uh, all 40 of them. Um, we also installed CCTVs to allow us more visibility of patients when they are already inside and, uh, uh, and adhered to DOH corridor measurements of two meters. So through the window, through this window, we can actually see all of these patients in the ICU. So uh, you can imagine how uh, doctors can communicate through an intercom and give orders uh, based on uh, what they see through the window. Uh, we can also see the other wards in the wards in the three compartment wards. And if you notice, there's a window here that allows us to see to the next compartment. So if you look from here, you can actually see to the next compartment, uh, some of the patients inside that. So visibility was uh, increased. Uh, I think that's one part that uh, lessens the need for uh, our doctors, healthcare workers to go inside and um, use PPE. So as I said, we finally, we were able to have an ideal uh, negative pressure uh, system. And you can see the uh, direction of the uh, steam here from this uh, uh, steam uh, producer, steam maker. 
uh, going inside away from this ward. No? So uh, the, there's extra protection for the healthcare workers uh, as they walk in the wards uh, because all the um, uh, air uh, carrying the virus um, are, are directed towards the ward and away from the corridor. So the next one is uh, uh, something that uh, we also realized again in hindsight when uh, uh, when we went to uh, uh, when we went back to our healthcare workers and um, studied what factors affected them and a lot of them were affected by the fact that they couldn't go home, uh, they had no there was no um, um, uh, capability to uh, relax uh, because malls were closed and other areas. So we thought. Uh, we we uh, somehow we dissipate some of the anxiety by uh, uh, refurbishing our gardens um, uh, inside uh, the hospital and allowing them uh, areas where they can um, uh, partake of some of their uh, uh, indulgences. Uh, and we put up a coffee uh, shop uh, right in the middle of the uh, hospital. So. Uh, this, are, this is not something we've had in PGH uh, uh, in the past, and uh, I think the realization that uh, you know, our healthcare workers needed to be taken care of better uh, led us to this um, uh, intervention also. Um, providing refuge areas all, uh, will also require uh, providing uh, accommodation, uh, good accommodations, and uh, we are now in the process of renovating the nurse's home. We have started with the smaller one. This is how it looked like before the pandemic. No? And during the whole time of the pandemic, we started our renovation. It looks like this now, restored to its 1911 uh, uh, spec specifications. And the rooms are uh, wider, uh, brighter, and uh, breezier. No? So uh, as I said, I think we should start uh, providing refuge for our healthcare workers, even inside the hospital. And um, in addition to that, uh, um, structures are not enough. Uh, we should uh, just an additional. This is not infrastructure anymore, but I, I guess it's really more of the human touch that you put to all of these refuge areas that will make the the uh, caring for them more complete. No? Um, from all the way from uh, reminding them to moisturize after wearing their N95s to psychosocial care, and of course the spiritual and uh, emotional support from our chaplains. So. Uh, it, the, in short, uh, this is uh, just a summary of, I think, major areas of uh, infrastructure intervention that uh, will help us in the future design you know, a, a, a better place uh, to take care of our patients and our healthcare workers. And we have done just that in the middle of the pandemic while we were planning for this 15-story multi-specialty building uh, with the uh, um, uh, clinical or patient areas in the top four floors. And the uh, uh, outpatient and uh, laboratory, parking, um, dialysis center, the burn unit in the uh, bottom floors, um, we uh, realized that we could actually use this as a model for to be a pandemic ready building. So in the design, the final design, two shafts of elevators were planned instead of one. One, the major one, which is seen here as gray, running from, um, running from the ground, uh, ground floor up, um, all the way up to the uh, top floors of the clinical area that in regular times. Uh, but uh, on a pandemic mode, we close off the areas uh, that are not clinical, that, that do not hold patients like the outpatient uh, department or the dialysis area or the child protection unit area and shift on elevator separate from the main one to bring the patients up into the clinical areas, into the patient area. So in effect, you are isolating your um, uh, other areas for continued use where, uh, so that you can, um, and at the same time, allowing the use of the, uh, what will be for the pandemic patients, this in particular case, maybe COVID patients, but separated in transport in an elevator uh, designed specifically to isolate them from the rest of the hospital. So. I think this will be an important uh, feature of um, uh, hospitals in the future uh, so that we don't disrupt uh, uh, all the services. No? We, maybe we will disrupt the wards and the uh, rooms for patients, 
uh, by uh, you know dis displacing the uh, those that really use them. Uh, but at least we maintain um, and continue services in other areas by isolating that area. So uh, I think um, uh, that's about it for uh, the infrastructure. And just to talk, uh, wrap it up um, in a in a bold attempt <laughs> to uh, make uh, uh, a proposal um, for uh, uh, hospital organizers and hospital administrators, maybe even the government, uh, that I think uh, learning from this pandemic, we realize that no, we can never really do it uh, alone. Uh, that's the worst thing that we can think of um, in a pandemic like this. So. Um, this has been a proposal uh, designed uh, during the uh, attempt for a social delivery, a service delivery network of NCR hospitals, which we thought could be uh, look uh, look back into and uh, and uh, see if we can use it for the current COVID crisis. So what the pandemic has done, it has impaired access to care. Um, this is the whole hospital. If you have a, if you were mandated to have 30 to 50 percent of our ward beds um, to COVID, and uh, unfortunately, those 30 to 50 percent affected the rest of the 70 percent more severely. That you cannot actually use the 70 percent anymore. So, in um, in effect, services to other done COVID cases really suffered. And as an example of that. Uh, when we started doing surgery in June of 2020 in neurosurgery and, and we were going back to our brain tumor patients, we found out that almost 20% of them have died already because of tumor progression or disease progression. So it has limited our ability to uh, do what we do best, uh, giving the other uh, highly specialized care. So maybe um, if we uh, uh, just get out of the old model of what is going on now. No. This patient with COVID goes to hospitals that hopefully will take them in. And that's why it is very common to hear when they get to us, they've been to 20 hospitals. Uh, one patient even saying 40 hospitals um, all the way from uh, Laguna. So um, so the uh, without a, an organized delivery network, it was a patient in an ambulance brought to any hospital that eventually will take him in. and. Uh, Unfortunately, sometimes it was too late, maybe um, for that patient uh, already on the road too long. So uh, with an SDN uh, service delivery network, the uh, um, uh, agreed functions of uh, all these hospitals will expand the ability for a, a, a patient um, to have more entitlements to the services of this uh, uh, network of hospitals. No? Um, and, but the um, uh, function or the uh, uh, ability of these hospitals to give service will depend a lot on uh, the man general joint management of these hospitals and will require a command center. Uh, uh, a command center that will dictate who moves to what hospital at what time um, uh, uh, during the, the, the time of uh, need of the patient. So uh, this is the command center uh, is now uh, the uh, uh, main uh, connection of all the hospitals who in this model do not talk to each other. But as we have uh, experienced in this crisis when uh, the uh, NCR hospitals were organized into a loose uh, referral system, it really worked for us. And I thought it would be good to um, make that a um, formal tie-up. Uh, and of course, only the government can do that. So uh, an another important um, factor in making a service delivery network function well is common financing. So all of these hospitals should uh, know or should be assured that they'll get paid for whatever services they render uh, by whoever patient that goes there. No? Doesn't have to be a patient from their local government unit, as long as the network agrees that any patient that gets into their network gets a service that is um, uh, common to all of them. So, um, so it, the uh, concept is uh, born out of the, of the ability of hospital to commit what 
uh, type and how many beds um, they can to a common pool of, um, of beds that will be used specifically for a particular disease and in our case, COVID. So imagine if those hospitals have committed their beds, uh, you virtually have a big collection of or conglomeration of bed units that will uh, that the command center can use no, to um, to uh, um, place uh, patients or transfer them from one facility to the other, no. and the commitment uh, is up to that uh, point that the hospital can provide without compromising the rest of the hospital of the services. No. Uh, it is easy to understand how patients who open their doors to patients get overwhelmed because uh, it, you know, it goes around that that hospital is taking in patients and eventually uh, they get overwhelmed by uh, the deluge of patients that come in. But in a command uh, center basis type of uh, referral, no one moves uh, without uh, being um, given the go signal and they only move to these blue slots provided for by the hospital. So that is having like a, you know, a, a virtual uh, uh, hospital uh, with an assured number of beds. You know? So uh, the, this, this is another uh, uh, representation of that when uh, you, you actually take the committed number of beds per hospital and you group them together virtually and uh, you can actually now assure patients that they have a bed to go to uh, within the members of that service delivery network. Or the other way uh, that we can do it also is have an actual hospital. One of these hospitals probably will be closed down completely um, and taking all these green, green spots as uh, the, the main mega hospital taking in COVID patients, relieving these other hospitals of uh, COVID patients, allowing them to serve the non-COVID ones. So what will the COVID uh, uh, main COVID hospital get from this? No? Uh, of course, um, because these hospitals have allotted this number of beds for that uh, uh, for COVID services, they are now obligated to send this um, um, uh, complement of support, whether man you know, manpower, including resources, respirators, hypnosal cannulas, medication, to support those beds that are going to be. Uh, absorbed by this hospital. So uh, you don't abandon this ho hospital to look for resources on its own. You actually provide from each hospital the appropriate uh, support that of the beds you would have had reserved for COVID and transferred to Omega Hospital. And uh, to bring it any further, um, um, we know that a lot of hospitals have training programs. So this other hospital should be ready to take in the trainees. Uh, of this hospital, of this um, uh, designated mega COVID hospital, we cannot let and, and uh, on a rotation basis, just like in a war, uh, we have conscripts that we train regularly to be ready to be able to handle uh, uh, COVID patients, and we have that now called Epic uh, uh, Emerging Practices and Innovative Care in COVID, um, which we uh, uh, have a regular. Um, online education for non-IM residents and fellows. So we're able to prepare our doctors and nurses to be sent to this hospital on a rotation basis so that you relieve also the, the workers of this hospital of, um, of chronic, uh, um, chronically being exposed to COVID and uh, the fatigue that comes with it. So that's the one word concept that we uh, have been um, working on and hopefully uh, uh, further uh, uh, um, make it uh, more, uh, 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 make it uh, have a finer uh, uh, feature, uh, more specific in nature and we're working on that. But uh, uh, the important thing is that all of these participants in the, uh, in the network are willing to uh, pull their resources, their logistics, and then their training. So what is imperative in if you take this model, if you go this way, is the command center. And um, the Johns Hopkins Command Center has shown how effectively uh, this uh, uh, intervention uh, can improve the efficiency of a uh, network. And um, of course, PhilHealth should be able to uh, 
assure should be able to assure us that uh, we're going to get paid for the services we rendered and also um uh what important and uh, probably the key to making this work especially the referral system is the constant streaming of data from all these hospitals so the command center this common hospital that they'll build so that the command center has accurate data of uh, uh, sending patients to and from the COVID referral centers or even the virtual beds that we will able to that we will uh, put together um, in, a, in, a, in an SDN. So the uh, uh, a, the um, uh, responsibilities of each uh, hospital involved in the deli service delivery network is that they constantly communicate with each other and that they allow patients already in that delivery network access to their hospitals or their services, uh, whether COVID or non-COVID, um, to ensure that there's continuity of service. No? Um, of course, this cannot uh, be done in a uh, national scale. Uh, I think it's best done in uh, small um, district uh, levels or maybe even eventually uh, if it's perfected uh, into a regional uh, level. So uh, the uh, hospitals involved in the SDN should be able to access pooled fund. Um, they have additional revenue stream because there are more patients that will come to them uh, in an organized manner. And of course, um, the uh, ability of the patients to access uh, care, uh, the wide, the full range of care, even in COVID times is preserved. And I think that is the most important point of all. So, uh, with that, I'd like to um, uh, end my talk and um, and just maybe uh, as an end as an ending um, again remind you of the uh, lessons we've learned through this COVID. That uh, you know, for us to get through this, let us fight our fear, let us um, believe in good science, let us uh, not put our guard down at any time, and let us take care of each other, and maybe we'll be really resilient to anything that comes our way. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Wow, thank you very much, Gap. I think uh, if we could, we'd have a standing ovation. I think that's really brilliant, visionary. Um, and I think the idea of every hospital having some ability to have a highly controlled infection control uh, unit. And if that can be done in every province, you can imagine we wouldn't have all this suffering of people na balik, balik din nila alam saan sila pupunta, no? Mm -hmm. So, napahusay talaga. Oh my gosh, gap, naiiyak ko, nakikinig ako sa'yo, naiiyak ko. Parang, you know, while other people are complaining and saying this and that, uh, here you are with a uh, solution. Yun ang maganda, eh, di ba? Parang roll up our sleeves, let's have a solution. And I think this really is a uh, very, uh, what should I say? It's, it's a very viable plan. It can be done, eh. Hindi ito imposible. Pwedeng gawin to. Kailangan lang may will at saka gagawin, susuportan talaga ng, ano, ng gobyerno. Ay, nako. Thank you, Gap, so much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Sana marinig ng mga kinauukulan itong, ano, itong presentation mo at magkaroon ng idea na, you know, let's do this. What? We can do this. We can do it. Sige. Uh, Raymond, did you have something to say? I no, don't know. You're introducing the next one. Okay, sige. Yes, go. yes, I am. Thank you so much, uh, Director Gap. Uh, Really, he enlightened us uh, using the systems approach po, no? uh, on how uh, a hospital could be prepared and get ready for, for like a pandemic uh, and, uh, and uh, being able to provide services also. Not just for uh, COVID-19, but for other services. Uh, there's also an emphasis po on primary care level solutions. Uh, yung service delivery network na banggit naman po. So, very, very thankful to Director Gap for um, providing us with a brief overview. I especially enjoyed yung pong uh, mention na uh, na-preserve yung old nurses home nung uh, uh, circa 1911 pa po siya. So, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, so, now we will move on to our reactions from our two other experts. First, we will have the medical director of the St. Luke's Medical Center in Global City sa Taguig po ito. Pleasure to have with us today, uh, Dr. Dennis P. Serrano. Dr. Dennis? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for having me. No? Uh, if I can share my screen. 
Go ahead, sir. Uh, so that was a very nice presentation by Dr. Gak. Dr. Gak is still my boss in PGH. <laughs> uh, and continues to we continue to still collaborate and uh, and cooperate uh, in, in responding to this pandemic. No? So I hope you can see my slides. Yes, sir. Uh, well, please go ahead. Just a brief caption. I, the thing, I think the message, the message na gusto kong iparating na, you know, this pandemic does not discriminate whether you are a public or government hospital or or a private hospital. And uh, it, the, the response and the, the challenges and the problems and the responses that we that we had to come up with uh, at St. Luke's Medical Center at Global City were pretty much similar to, to what we have encountered in PGH. Fortunately, uh, this time last year, I was still working under Dr. Gap at the director's office uh, in PGH. And we were looking for all sorts of things. Uh, foremost among them were N95 masks were that, that were, you know, the na parang ginto at that time, you know, and, and of course the ventilators, the high flow nasal cannulas. And that, that sort of, you know, uh, that was sort of the same thing that was happening in, uh, in many of the private hospitals in, in Manila. So, you know, let me, let me just uh, give you, uh, give you a, a short story of how we fared during the pandemic, you know, grappling with the pandemic, then transitioning to the new normal, as we sort of, you know, call what we are embarking on now in this era. And then uh, probably I'll just end with, you know, some, some thoughts and uh, wish list for attorney, for attorney Luisa for, for redesigning for the future, no? And like, PGH, which, which is uh, more than 100 years old, St. Luke's Medical Center Global City is a little over 10 years old when the pandemic hit. Uh, we were one hospital building, if you do not count the medical arts building, which does not actually house patients. So our building that housed patient, patients was just really one building. It is a 500-bed hospital uh, located in the central business uh, district of Taguig. Having, you know, being there, we had limited open spaces, and that's where I missed the open spaces of uh, Philippine General Hospital. Uh, while Philippine General Hospital had a lot of free air, I think one of the one of the really ch challenges that, that modern buildings have is the centralized heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. You know, and that was one of the main co concerns uh, when the when the pandemic hit. Finally, uh, one of also one of the things that we had to grapple with was our small ER space, uh, and I will show that to you in, in a bit. So th those were the those were the challenges that we had. Uh, this is the emergency room of, of uh, St. Luke's Global City at the height of the pandemic. Technically, the emergency room can hold around thirty patients. It was really designed as a private emergency room. It was not going to be a pandemic or a public or public emergency room. Uh, it can hold up to 10 critical care patients and 22 moderate to severely ill patients. But of course, as you well know, we had, I think, in 20, between 2020 and 2021, uh, four waves of surges. And in every surge, uh, you know, we, we had patients overflowing. And I, I think one of the more uh, common announcements that, that people look out for was the announcement that the ER of St. Luke's is closed for COVID, uh, and that was sort of the trigger for all of the other hospitals, uh, private hospitals, to also declare that their ERs were, were closed for COVID. So what did we do? How did we cope? You know, what we had to do was, uh, in St. Luke's Global, we had to convert our driveway, you know, not just for, for triage, but also for sometimes for taking care of patients. And we had to dedicate uh, nursing staff and doctors uh, to patients who, who were overflowing in the ER to, uh, into our driveway. And it was only till recently, probably just about a couple of weeks ago, that we actually closed the driveway and converted it back to, to a driveway and, and we, we, we reclaimed the, the, ER, the driveway from the ER. The other thing that we also had to do was in, in separating COVID from non-COVID, uh, we had to move our clean, our quote unquote clean ER away from that, from our ER. We actually put uh, the clean ER in our ultrasound area located uh, a bit, a little bit away from the ER, uh, but still had the same access on the ground floor. So we had to, we had to make do with separation of the clean and dirty ERs. And, uh, you know, that was a, a bit tasking for us because uh, the flow of patients uh, from COVID to non-COVID was a challenge also. 
All right. So, you know, there was not enough beds. We wanted to transfer patients to other facilities, but other facilities uh, also were full. So the, the, cons, the, one, the one hospital concept of uh, Director Gap really is a welcome, is a welcome uh, solution. And I think that you know we really need to to partner uh, with with you in terms of that because uh, you know we can we can uh, really network better for for patients to be transferred. Uh, not only was the ER a problem, you know we had to uh, we also were filling up our wards and our ICUs. Let me start with the ICU. Our ICU allotment uh, initially was twenty ICU beds, but of course, especially during the last Delta surge, uh, we had to convert even our P2 uh, to a COVID ICU, and we were running more than uh, more than 30 patients, ICU patients at one time. The ER was also convert, semi-converted to you know to an ICU because we could not admit critical patients from the ER because there was no ICU uh, ICU beds to admit them. Uh, on top of the COVID ICU, we still had our regular ICU patients, and and th th those were also a lot. Uh, in as far as uh, the the COVID wards were concerned. Our mandate from from uh, uh, DOH was to convert at least thirty percent of our total bed allocation. And St. Luke's is a five hundred bed hospital. The total bed allocation of five hundred bed, thirty percent of that was around you know one hundred sixty beds. Uh, Twenty percent during the non-surge areas. Uh, total of uh, one hundred nine beds. We all uh, had to close three three units, not three floors, and uh, because of concerns for ventilation and and uh, and airflow, we decided to convert all of the to, to put all of our COVID uh, general nursing units in the south wing floors, and that maximum maximum occupancy uh, that was three south wing floors, uh, and that those south wing floors were converted uh, inside to to have isolation, ventilation, separate air ducts uh, in order to, to comply, you know, with, with, uh, with air flow. So that really was an, uh, an engineering challenge for us. Uh, and up to, fortunately now, we were now able to convert uh, back those floors to general, those uh, floors to general nursing units. Uh, and with the with lowering of the COVID cases nationally, we are now down uh, to one COVID floor. But at any one time, we are ready to, for any surge to convert back these uh, wards to, to COVID wards. The operating rooms uh, was also a problem. As you very well know, uh, the main operating room of, uh, of St. Louis Global City is just in one floor. And we could not separate, we could not mix COVID cases uh, in, in, the, in that main operating room complex. So fortunately, we had a medical arts building that had uh, an out, uh, four rooms for outpatient surgery uh, that were negative, uh, that had negative flow, and we converted that to our dedicated COVID OR. And we did that. That was done at the beginning of the pandemic up to now. That uh, outpatient surgery OR still serves as our uh, dedicated COVID OR, and we moved our outpatient surgeries now to the main operating room. Uh, Finally, one of the more, uh, more one of the bigger challenges that we had to face was rethinking human traffic flow, and you know we we have uh, we have 15 floors in St. Luke's, uh, and all of these floors are accessed by the same elevator systems, you know, and we have nine you know nine general elevators for for our for our patients, uh, but think rethinking COVID COVID traffic for this uh, for these areas, you know, we had to designate. Uh, one to two elevators for, for COVID patients and healthcare workers. So that was separated. And uh, also for that, we had to separate flow in the corridors for, for these patients who needed diagnostics in other parts of the hospital. If they needed CT scans, they had to be brought down. If they needed uh, MRIs, they had, to, they had to be brought down. So this was also separated. No? We, we separated CT scan machines for COVID. We separated uh, x-rays and MRIs and ultrasound for, for COVID patients, uh, just in order to, to be able to, you know, uh, have a semblance of separation of human traffic flow in the hospital. At the peak of the surge in March, you know, our occupancy rate for the general nursing units was 129%. Our, uh, and we were cohorting patients who were family members or who were relatives to the same rooms. You know, our ICU beds was around 135%, and that is because 
we were running an ICU in the in the emergency room, and that that went on for several months. At some, at, at one point, we had uh, we had more ICU cases or critical patients in the emergency room than what what we had in our in our liver ICU uh, COVID area. So that was uh, how we grappled with the with the uh, allocation of spaces for the patients. But we also realized that uh, in, 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 in uh, responding to the pandemic, we, have, we also had to take care of our healthcare workers. And during the height of the, of the surge and the pandemic, many of our healthcare workers were unable to go home. We had to, we had to give them accommodations. Uh, they were given free food in these accommodations. Uh, for those who opted to go home, a shuttle service was provided. Uh, and you know that, that shuttle both these were these were not cheap. No, uh, we provided free transportation in and around the 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 whole of Metro Manila, and uh, this amounted to more than a million uh, pesos of expenses per month. Uh, not to mention the expenses for for the for the accommodation of the healthcare workers. But at the at the time of the pandemic, you know, uh, the help the management of St. Luke's, you know, through all, through through the, through the proverbial uh, profit and loss uh, statement or the profit and loss sheet out the window, we were not concerned with you know uh, the profit and loss for for on a monthly basis. Uh, essentially, it was uh, really the the response to the pandemic that became the priority. Uh, one of the things that we also learned uh, and that pretty, pretty much also applied in PGH was we had to rely on a lot of remote monitoring for patients in the COVID areas, uh, tele telemedicine and uh, remote CCTV monitoring uh, to, to lower down direct patient contact. Uh, and then at, at the same time, ensure that our patients were being monitored properly, our patients were getting uh, the, the care that they needed. Finally, as we transitioned uh, and as we emerged out of the pandemic, and this was the first, this was in between waves, no? sometime uh, Ju July of, of uh, 2020, we realized that we had to reopen uh, the parts of the hospital that needed to take care of the patients uh, that were non-COVID. And one of the things that we felt that needed really needed emphasis was in order to convince patients to come back and to get their medical care for the non-COVID uh, concerns, we had to convince them that, that this, the hospital was safe to, con to come back to. Little did we realize that, you know, in, in order for patients to be convinced, what we had to do first that we had was to convince our own doctors that it was, that it was already safe to go back and hold clinic. So we retrofitted many of the, uh, the routes in the medical arts building. Uh, in order to to ensure that there was good traffic flow for for uh, for people, uh, yeah, the the fans that Dr. Legaspi mentioned uh, in in the in wards one and three were also considered uh, for the individual for the individual medical arts building clinics. This is also the time that many people were were all all sold out on you know getting the the uh, HEPA filters. And the air filters, and really there was, uh, and, and I remember this because even in PGH, uh, all of the units were asking for, you know, for HEPA filters for individual rooms. So we needed to convince everyone that it was safe to come back. Uh, what did we do? We had to convert or we had to uh, 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 change many of our open, limited open spaces, uh, but they're not actually open because they're still under some centralized air, air conditioning. Uh, to the triage areas and to waiting areas, and in order to in order to limit traffic of patients going up to the to the medical arts building clinics, and we devised a way to you know to queue patients uh, down in the common areas. Uh, we had we employed strict scheduling of patients so that there will not be a there will not be a pool of patients you know con conglomerating in, in the common areas of the hospital. Finally. Uh, this is sort of just a wish list for for architect Luisa is gonna talk after me. Uh, we had, you know, there are there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of literature out there for redesigning hospitals for the future. Uh, you know, looking at versatility, looking at surge readiness, supporting well-being of the healthcare workers, as Dr. Gap emphasized, clean air and surfaces, uh, the emphasis on isolation, containment, and separation of patients. Finally, flow. Uh, flow not just of health uh, of patients, but also for healthcare workers, but and also for 
flow of everything else, supplies and, and, and services, and finally, digital and physical transformation. But for me, I think uh, for the Philippines, uh, and, and I think this is something that we need to rethink for many of our hospitals if we're going to retrofit, uh, is that we have to be versatile and, and surge ready because we'll never know when there's going to be another surge. We have to incorporate flexible spaces uh, that can serve, you know, both as refuge, but also can be utilized uh, once there is a pandemic and uh, can be can be a surge uh, uh, a surge area for for the pandemic response. Uh, we need to rethink how we need, how we can isolate, contain, and separate our individual wards and our individual areas, uh, and you know how we can do that efficiently, uh, fast. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, by doing so, allow the rest of the hospital to function normally for the non-pandemic patients. We have to realize that business goes on as usual for the rest of the hospital. So I think this is, this is my wish list for Architect Luisa. Uh, you know, uh, finally, engineering innovations. We've heard a lot about airflow, and I think really this is, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of innovations now for, for HVAC, for uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, we uh, for the new hospitals, we have to rethink about human traffic flow and uh, maybe allowing more for open air access sites. And I hope that you know, as we embark on redesigning our Philippine hospitals in the future, this will all be uh, considered because really, this this pandemic is here uh, to stay with us. I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much, and uh, congratulations to Dr. Gap. And I look forward to hear, hearing. Uh, architect Luisa's input on, on these new changes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dennis Serrano. Nako, another uh, very good presentation showing how how you have to adapt, no? Parang ano, ano, walang, walang urungan eh. Kailangan talagang gagawa, gagawa ng, ng paraan, no? And even for a hospital like St. Luke's, which is perceived to have a lot of resources and so on, you could also be um, overwhelmed, right? By just so many people coming in. So we really appreciate your sharing your thoughts on, um, on the private sector and uh, looking forward to having you in our panel discussion. Raymond, did you want to say something? No, thank, thank you lang. Uh, it's been a while since uh, I, I've, I've seen Dr. Serrano's face. Uh, he used to be one of our preceptors <laughs> during, <laughs> during med school. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, we we will now move on to our third and final uh, panelist for today. Uh, uh -oh. Not exactly po from um, from the medical sector, but really an expert po in her field. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Susie. Oh, sige, Raymond. Kasi gusto ko siyang introduce dahil ano eh. You know, when I met our, our speaker, I was just so blown away by her ano no, parang... Ano rin to, Henry rin eh, no? may genius, may pagka-genius siya eh. No? Hindi lang may pagka-genius, genius siya sa architecture. Sabi nga natin, para ma-solve natin yung problema ng pandemic, di ba? we always say this, lahat ng talino kailangan natin, hindi lang mga doktor, hindi lang mga nurse, hindi lang yung mga, ano, yung mga nasa laboratories. But in this case, because of uh, the problem of ventilation, the problem of crowding, you really need people who work on design and really know how to fix spaces. No? So uh, I, met, I met our speaker some years back and I was just blown away by some of her, some of the work that she's done. I said, my goodness, no? parang ito yung mga kailangan nating mga idea, no? para hindi lang para sa pandemia, pero hindi sa mga baha, di ba? para sa lindol, para sa lahat ng klaseng sakuna because we are one of the most disaster-prone countries in the whole world. And in terms of climate, uh, recently, um, there was a German, German group, German Watch, that said we were number four at risk for climate change. And it's true. No? Pag umuulan, bumabaha. Pag nagda-drought, wala. Sira lahat ng agrikultura natin. No? Um, we really have to be forward-looking, have a vision, but we really need to work with our architects. And it's my honor and my privilege to introduce someone who became my friend. And uh, I'm actually glad that she's here because I wanted her to meet Gap and to meet Dennis also. Because uh, maybe you can connive and put something together. No? So I'd like to welcome Dr. Louis, uh, Louis Daya Garcia, 
who is uh, one of the multi-awarded green architects of the Philippines. Louis, welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Dr. Susie, I am tickled pink by your introduction. Maraming salamat. <laughs> you know, also, no, um, if, if I may, no, I'd like to commend also Dr. Gap no, for his presentation. Um, he was talking about flexibility of spaces, about you know, versatility, naman si Dr. Legaspi. And when it was and when they were presenting, I felt like Para ako nakikinig din sa mga architects, no? So it's very clear to me that you were able to, you know, discuss these things with um, many experts. And I would like to also, tatlo na ang nagsabi nito, si Dr. Susie, si Dr. Gap, tsaka si Dr. Um, Legaspi, sabi nilang lahat, no? Na uh, si Dr. Serrano, sinabi nilang lahat na we all need everyone for us to be able to make this work. So wala kasing one expert can solve all the can solve all of these no so the same thing with design so hindi pwedeng isa lang yung aayusin natin and then makakalimutan natin yung iba and so with that i'd like to present to you um this uh, that my reaction ano so konting kwento lang so this was me 3 weeks ago in a hospital i'm sure you have done this attire no so so many days of your lives for the past year but it was um a novel for me no novel tito sa akin um because i was the companion of my mom you know i will tell you a story that's not um documented this is undocumented wala tong scientific basis kwento ko lang no pinagkukumpara ko lang at the time that this was happening um many of my kin or relatives cousins etc were affected by covid sabay sabay kami halos lahat and at during this this time that uh, this was uh, this photo was taken kasama ko yung mom ko sa hospital and my my brother was also in the hospital Ang pagkakaiba, magkaibang hospital sila kasi depende nga kung ano yung napasukan namin. Ano. In this hospital, allowed ang companion. My mom is 86 years old and she was able to get out of that hospital right away. Maybe because there's she had a companion kasama ako. So meron siyang um, sort of um, you know emotional support and all that. May kakwentuhan. Whereas my, my brother, who's a lot younger, no? Um, it took him like three weeks in the hospital. Ang tagal ng kanyang recovery hanggang ngayon. And yung anxiety niya, uh, iba yung level as compared to my mom. Parehas naman silang COVID, you know. And so um, with that, no, um, kino-compare ko yung practice ko with that experience. I have to have a scientific uh, backing for that. But if we are to talk about green buildings, um, I'd like to believe na meron siyang connection, no? So let's go to COVID-19 and air quality. We know we know for a fact that uh, you know COVID is a respiratory disease and um, that our lungs are affected uh, by the air that we breathe. No, so um, we um, CDC has already confirmed that uh, COVID is COVID is airborne, and therefore inhaling air that's contaminated with the virus can can. Uh, make us sick, no? So ang, ang intention dito is how do we dilute the, the air particles or the virus particles para hindi natin masagap lahat, no? Kasi pag maliit yung amount, mas makonti yung effect sa atin, mas marami, of course, mas marami yung, yung sakit na makukuha natin. Again, it all depends on our immune system, no? So this is um, similar to if we are conscious about the water that we are drinking, the food that we are eating, yung cleanliness niya, we also have to make sure, especially at this time, that the air that we breathe is of quality, of good quality. No? So you know this, you've seen a lot of uh, photos of this. This is a photo of the Philippines, Sierra Madre on the right, and on the left is pre-COVID. No? So you'll readily see the kind of air that we have been breathing, No, so pre-COVID. And so um, going to the uh, building mismo, no? we have to understand that there's a thing called sick building syndrome. And the, the ones presented here are the uh, minor ailments, I, I would say, no. Um, in many studies, in many reports, uh, in many researches, um, nakalagay doon that sick building syndrome could even cause um, uh, deaths, no. For example, na lang yung the use of asbestos in the past, no. Dati usong usong paggamit ng asbestos at tinatanggal na yan ngayon, banned na yan ngayon because um, nagkosha ng maraming 
ng, ng cancer sa maraming uh, uh, building occupants. No? And not only that, sick building syndrome is not just physical manifestation. No? It affects our mental and psychological um, uh, health. No? So um, marami din studies, if you, I'm sure, because you're all doctors, you'll be able to see yung mga risks of uh, suicide and depression because nakukulong sila sa you know, condo nila, mag-isa sila, or sa building nila. Wala silang lugar na lalabasan. And so with all of these um, things, no um uh, i i was uh, i am you know i am uh, privileged to be able to draft a policy on climate smart buildings and um beyond the uh, green building designs which are all focused on the environment and how we can protect the environment how we can be sustainable in the environment ang focus ng climate smart buildings is about humans no about people it has to to evolve kasi nakakalimutan na natin yung yung Para sa tao naman ng buildings talaga, di ba? We have to remember that pre-COVID period, um, people are are uh, inside buildings, no? 90% of the time. So we go to the office, we go to mass, we go to the church, we're staying at home, we go to the theaters. These are all these are all indoor spaces, no? And therefore, the, the air that we breathe in these indoor spaces matter to our um, health, no? To our lung health. And um, also, nung after nga, nung pinakita do, ko do sa photo, na after nitong uh, COVID, ngayong COVID rather, no? Um, um, uh, nagkaroon tayo ng mga lockdowns and all that, 99 to 100%, we are inside buildings. And uh, that really is, we should be alerted with, with uh, that uh, condition. So in the climate smart buildings, kanina nagbigay si uh, Dr. Lega Serrano no, ng kanyang wish list. Um, this is some sort of um, a plan, no? a design consideration in climate smart buildings. All buildings will have to be holistic, no? So pinag-uusapan dito hindi lang physical building design. We have to talk about health, about the vulnerabilities of the people inside it, no? Kung paano natin siya i-design, how how do these windows or the roof or the gardens or how do the materials affect, you, you know, the building occupants? Ano yung mga vulnerabilities ito? Flexible ba ito? Kanina pinag-uusapan natin flexibility. And we also have to take advantage of technology that we have now. I remember in the hospitals, no, may mga Wi-Fi na ngayon. And we were able to talk to the nurses and to our family members members using just our you know our, our computers or our phones no so environmental development is also a big aspect in this no because every time we build something every every time we we you know um uh, develop something progress construction and all that no we make an impact we have negative impacts to the environment and therefore our government is is very important in this whole discussion hindi lang to pang arkitekto o pang doktor Lahat ng stakeholders kailan kasama natin dito. Sinabi nga ng tatlo nating um, doctors ahead of me kanina na we need everybody on board to be able to have a solution to this. And so climate smart buildings is, is all about integrated sustainable building ecology. You're talking of ecology and science and buildings may ecology, may ecology din. Ano yung relationship natin with, um, with each other or how do the organisms present, visible or invisible, affect us no? in, uh, in that uh, indoor environment? And so before we even go indoors, we have to understand Ano ba yung nangyayari sa site? For us to be able to understand how we're going to, paano yung goals natin, paano natin siya um, ita-target. No? We have to understand the site. Madalas, no, when we build new buildings, it's very critical for us to find out ano ba yung demographics. Bakit ba we have to understand that. No? Bakit kulang yung mga bedrooms natin or mga wards natin. Tapos yung mga tao na may, may sakit, ang dami-dami, we cannot attend to that. Because we have to, number one, up upgrade you know the number of uh, of our rooms alam niya, alam naman natin yung progress no dumadami population natin and therefore yung yung quantity ng mga bedrooms natin we also have to be um um uh, addressed no so marami pang iba like the site you know um we we want to maximize the air because kanina importante yung well hindi well, important is ventilation. And therefore, your wind pattern will have to be simulated. May mga computers tayo to be able, for us to be able to identify gano kalakas or gano kakonte ang gusto nating air na i-play palabas or papasok without um, mechanical intervention. So many things that we can um, discuss. Now, ito yung uh, kaninang wish list ni Dr. Serrano. No? So I'm sure you were able to, to discuss this with your architects. I've been in touch with Arup, galing to kay Arup, no? um, one of the top uh, top. Uh, 
uh, engineers, uh, engineer, engineering firms in the in the world. No, so this is how they are designing pandemic resilient healthcare uh, design, and it's um, comparable to the climate smart buildings that we are currently drafting in the Philippines. No, so uh, meron tong versatility yung kanina natin pinag-uusapan multi-purpose areas ang kailangan natin na dating say pantry gagawin na natin siya ngayong staff um, unit etc. No, has is surge ready. So how do we multiply our rooms for us to be able to uh, bring uh, bring in the, the the patients? For example, kanina marami examples yung mga garages or yung mga parking spaces ginawa na rin triage and all that. And we also have to support well-being. Now this one is where the architects can can come in because the five senses will have to be addressed this is uh, well-being na to. We're talking of the technicalities of HVAC, um, HVAC systems, air conditioning systems. We were talking about ventilation and all that, but what about our psychological needs? Um, do we want to really be in a hospital at this time and uh, at this time, no? Na pan pandemia, no? So, kukulong ka, isolate ka, anong makikita mo? Do you even have a garden? Do you even have um, uh, a refuge, you know? So, parang, pa pa paano ka? I, I was, um, kaya kanina, I, I mentioned about um, my, my brother and my mom, kasi yung well-being nila totally magkaiba when actually they're just in the same, um, uh, you know, room, no? And so, um, we have to have our clean air and surfaces, antibacterial ba yung materials natin, we have to make sure that our materials are easy to clean, you know? Um, less horizontal features, I'll show you later um, the kinds of, uh, if I still have the time, kailangan less horizontal features para pagdapo ng, ng dust. Um, hindi masyadong maraming dust yung dadapo. If possible, lahat vertical yung mga spaces. So all the mga nooks and crannies na nilalagay natin as decorations, especially in hospitals, let's uh, get away with those. Now, there are um, actually three basic um, uh, considerations no? when we design whether it's a new building or um, a, retro, uh, retro, a building for retrofit. So we have three. No? Transmission, ang kailangan nating isipin. Ano ang pwede nating features when we, when we design um, health spaces? Um, surface, kasi may surface uh, contamination, droplet contamination and airborne. And as we know, um, um, COVID is uh, airborne. So itong lahat, ginagawan ito ng design solution solutions in an architectural perspective no um many many things no um uh, i you know um marami examples no this one is just a ward an example of the ward no now yung flexibility nangyayari so from a non covid is on the one on the left non covid or non surge no uh, hospital hallway to a uh, surge unit no so ang nakikita natin dito na trend is nagkakaroon ng ante room no? or a foyer no so um it's a room before you enter a room um Initially, no, in the past, ang mga houses or ang mga buildings palaging may ganyan. So we call them now lobbies. Before you even enter a building or a house, may ante room muna. So they wait for that. So ang, ang trend ngayon ng mga isolation rooms is to have that ante room so that yung, yung, yung patient will be totally isolated. No? So of course, um, I will not be um, exploring or expounding on HVAC system, but those are very, very critical. Ventilation is critical. The number or, or the quantity, yung air change um, rates no, per hour is very critical. Negative pressure is critical. So uh, because nga sinasabi natin, it, this is airborne, um, we, we have to take care of our lungs. So everything that we breathe should be, you know, clean to the highest degree, no? if I may say that. And so um, this is an example of um, uh, a room. No? Uh, pwede kasi siyang pang retrofit. Pag limited ang space, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll do away with this. No, We need spaces for anti-room and then we'll just uh, upgrade with ventilation. So may mga pros and cons no, for, 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 for ventilation upgrades. And uh, we have many studies on that. It's very technical. Just something I'd like to share with you. No? This is the before and after of your ducting system, air conditioning systems ito, ng mga, um, ng mga commercial establishments. The one on the left side was before occupation si construction pa lang yung pinag-uusapan natin ano and a lot of commercial establishments kung hindi naga-apply ng green certification they just move in so yung occupants occupants come in for as long as meron na silang 
uh, uh, building occupancy. But if you look at the ductive system, ganito yung itsura. So, you know, day in, day out, and then so many so many days will pass years, no, hindi nalilinis, yung alikabok during construction is the same air that we are breathing, no, when we are occupying the buildings. So, what more, no, kapag nasa hospital tayo and ang ducting system natin ay hindi masyadong nalilinis. Again, the key is we have to clean even the surfaces that are you know, invisible or hidden to us. So these are techniques on how to do, uh, how to differentiate negative airflow and uh, direct exhaust, kind of technical, but it was already mentioned earlier. And, um, you know, we have to also go beyond our building standards, no? Ang building standards natin normally in hospitals, ganito lang, oh, good for, for, for a wheelchair and then merong tao. But we have to expand that, no? So pinag-usapan din kanina yung mga one-way flow. And that's also very critical. So if we can expand our hallways, we do that as well. Again, airflow, no? Um, if you look at the history of um, uh, healthcare facilities in the past, no? Um, palagi silang merong atrium, not just healthcare facilities, but most um, buildings, most structures in tropical countries. Meron siyang airflow kasi that's a very critical in tropical areas or in non-tropical um, regions also. So you'll see here two kinds of um, uh, passage where wind passage. No, yung isa is yung longitudinal, the other one is naka-atrium type. And PGH, you know, I'm re really happy because ito, it's, it's an old building, a good example of a, an old building na meron siya talagang atrium where you can put your garden. And because plants can filter the air, it's one way of, you know, natural filtration. <clears throat> Earlier, I discussed about um, not putting too many horizontal ledges. And this is one of the major boo-boos that I've been seeing. Just to, again, tell you a little story, no? I have this um, client no, years ago na lahat silang buong pamilya nila, meron silang um, asthma. And uh, they were saying lahi daw nila, so meron sila yung neighbor nila na kapitbahay nila na, na relatives nila may asthma din silang lahat. And so I, I told them ano yung mga pwede nilang tanggalin kasi baka nagte-trigger na asthma. And so everything was sinunod naman nila to the dot. No? And, the, and then um, when I visited, the site visit ako, one culprit was the cove lighting. Usong-uso to in the 80s. No? I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with cove lighting, pero para siyang yung pocket where you hide your, your, your light. Para medyo dramatic yung effect, no? may, may diffused light ka. But if when I when I went there and saw how how it was, no, and daming yung mga insect droppings, and daming dead insects, may mga rodents, you know, na mamahay dun lahat. So if, especially in hospitals, it's you know this is something that's very basic, but I'm still seeing this in a lot of um, structures, no, hospital and not. May mga cove lighting pa rin sila. There there's there are many technologies now, no, uh, technological upgrades, lighting upgrades that you can do and get away with this. Um, dust accumulating um, respiratory risk feature, architectural feature. And I, um, I'd like to also mention that we cannot forget no, <clears throat> that um, climate change is caused by um, carbon emissions. Carbon emissions is um, uh, through the burning of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels. Ginagamit natin to sa kuryente natin. So we have to ask ourselves in the medical uh, field, no, Nagpapagaling tayo ng patients, nagpapapasok tayo ng patients because we want to give them uh, care, no? But what about those who are not coming in as patients? How do you care for them? We have to think about the, the energy that we are burning because dinadagdag natin yan, the carbon emissions natin dun sa air, and which cause climate change. And we know that climate change could be, you know, climate change is actually bigger than COVID, no? And uh, if we are now panicking because of COVID, uh, we have to also think about climate change because it will really change our lives it is already changing our lives and uh you know you're flooding and all in all that no remember that walang vaccine sa climate change hindi tayo pwedeng mag lockdown because may climate change climate change would mean 
wala tayong pagkain because you know drought wala tayong pagkain because baha you know yung economy natin bagsak and all wala tayong kuryente communication etc and we are very unhealthy um because of you know pollution and all that so many many layers of um problems of climate change and so we have to attend to that and if i may add to the wish list of dr um uh, dr serrano no let's also include the 17 sdgs or the 17 sustainable development goals of the united nations no so these can all be incorporated in in any building i would say in any structure or in any office no and so um to simplify everything that we've been hearing we have come up with three um simple uh, terms to remember you know, in climate smart buildings it's called the triple s approach um we have to design for survivability and if this is in your mind paano ka makaka survive no with this lockdown and all dapat may tubig ka so how do you design for water na meron kang water all the time paano pag nagsara yung utility mo may tubig ka pa rin ba so you have to be self sufficient as, as well no many of us experience this na lockdown tayo wala tayong ayuda so where do you get your food so um this things ano so kailangan you think about that it should be a feature in all buildings. We have been promoting this many, many years ago, and this is something that you cannot find in green building certifications, but for, for humans to survive in lockdowns and in pandemics, you have to think of self-sufficiency. How do you make them self-sufficient? And again, sustainability will be a part of any green building design or any green um, um, intervention. Uh, regeneration of sustainable features should be there. So how do you replenish water? How do you replenish food, et cetera, et cetera? How do you even have corriente when, when there's no um, uh, power in the utility? So uh, because uh, energy is the main culprit of climate change in most projects, palaging yan yung nauuna i-design. No? So the target is to really reduce. No? The projects that I'm going to show you, mabilis lang to, will be from small projects to big projects to communities, meaning what I want to tell you is there is no limit or there are no limitations when we're talking of green design. So from a small house, we can reduce energy by 80% water consumption by 50%, no? So um, this is a very sustainable house, this won an award, because um, very self-sufficient siya, and this was designed 12 years ago. And um, nung nagkaroon ng pandemic, you know, hindi nila kailangan mag-aircon, hindi nila kailangan lumabas, meron silang pagkain makukuha, merong fish, merong, uh, merong mga fruit-bearing plants and trees and all that. I am telling you this concept because the concepts here, the features, architectural features here, are also um, present in the other big projects that we have been doing. May mga rainwater collection system ito. Again, um, iba-ibang uh, uh, definition, iba-ibang solutions, magnitude solutions, depending on the scale of the, the project. Now, this one is a mid-scale project. This is Bagong Senado. And again, the reduction is 70%, 50%. But right now, we are discussing if we can go net zero, meaning zero energy coming from uh from uh bad fuels not from from dirty fuels no so we want to do um clean energy here and you'll see we were able to reduce the energy through intelligent systems by applying lang yung parang cover parang payong no we call it the building envelope so how do you address that now um another project is the metropolitan theater um I, i'd like i'm i'm i included this because pgh is an old building, same as Metropolitan Theater, but we were able to make green interventions, no? um, reduce energy, make uh, the air cleaner, etc., cetera, um, through simulations, computer simulations, and all, a lot of experimentations also. And uh, you know, we have daylighting studies, medyo dumilim na dito sa area na to, but what I'm really proud of is, of course, I'm really proud of the cost na reduce namin, ano? but what I'm really proud of is um, this one. No, so this is we it, ultrasound. It, you are doctors, and you know me. Mga ultrasound kayo, no? In buildings, meron din kami ng ultrasound, and we were able to find the cause of mildew, of molds, of fungi in the air, in the theater, because may baha sa ilalim. And, uh, you know, um, technology now is very, um, you know, I'm very happy with technology now. And so you combine it with, you know, your your practicality and with your green concepts. It's it's 
win-win situation for everyone. And again, this is another old building, but not so old. No, it's an institution. And uh, just to show you, you mga daylighting, um, uh, daylighting harvesting. You know, the reason why I want to point out the, the importance of daylight harvesting is because alam naman natin lahat that sunlight is a natural sanitizer. And um, it, it, it reduces right away your mga airborne uh, germs and the bacteria natin. Not everything can be addressed by sunlight, no. But but uh, if we can have that, it can also affect our hormones, no. Kasama to the sick building syndrome re research, it can regulate our melatonin, regulate everything. You know, your the doctors here. I, I do not even want to expound on that. But really, green building should be able to um to to regulate your hormones as well. If you study, um, if you apply it to mga daylight harvesting and all that. And um, I mentioned earlier nung nagkita nga kami ni Dr. Susie, ito yung isang project na you know, pinag-usapan namin because this was clearly pre-COVID. Ano? This was in 2018, no, Dr. Susie. And uh, again, this is um, a manifestation of how we should be designing spaces. No? So it's not just about technical or technology or about um, just ventilation alone or lighting alone. We also have to think about yung triple S, na sustainability and self-sufficiency and survivability. And so these are some photos of some projects no? Um, with the features, architecture, architectural engineering features and the, with the green features. And pinag-usapan yung flexibility. You know how flexible this project is, no? Ito yung kaninang bahay. We were able to make something out of it, no? So you were talking about staff housing. How fast could you build staff housing, no? So paano kung biglang nagkaroon ulit ng surge and wala kayong nursing station katulad ng sa PGH, no? If we have available lots, these are red, this can readily be um, installed, no? These are mod modular house, housing um, uh, units, no? And then if you develop that, any further, pwede rin siyang maging isang lying-in clinic or a small clinic. Pinag-usapan natin na merong, um, you know, atrium or airflow and all that. It's very flexible, no? similar to your concept of administration in hospitals. Your buildings also will have to be flexible enough. So just to, you know, give you an example of how biophilic design or regenerative sustainability is in other countries. This is an example of a hospital in um, Singapore. This is the Kutek um, uh, uh Putek Pot Hospital, no? Yung what meron silang water view, but this is actually man-made. Dito na collect yung rainwater nila, reused the uh, wastewater. They created like a lagoon out of it. And then they made sure na yung mga patients will have a good view of uh, the, the man-made lake na actually um, a green feature nila, no? So maraming ways on how to do it, no? So this is an example of biophilic. And it's the same hospital na nung, nung nagkaroon ng uh, pandemic, no? Yung triage nila was really just outside, no? So bago pumasok at ma-infect yung loob ng building, nandito na sila sa labas. So it was flexible in that way dati, parang outdoor spaces lang siya, lobby and all, tas naging effective siya nung nagkaroon ng pandemic. And again, Again, the importance of atrium. This is a new building, but again, because Singapore is a, another tropical country, no, mainit dito, so ventilation is very critical. So more examples of uh, of uh, you know biophilic design. Um, again, this is uh, it was presented earlier. It's a sensadong comunidad ali sa Pilipino. <clears throat> It's an example of how we should be designing really for, for emergency spaces so you can thrive in this. It's a, it's a, a multi-purpose uh, facility. Hindi siya magiging white elephant because um, pwede, siyang mag, pwede siyang maging training grounds. Na pag walang pandemic or pag walang anything, it could be turned into something else. No? So may social impact because you'll be teaching the community how they can be how, how they can survive during pandemics may mga yung, yung lobbies nila open or hallways are all open for ventilation again clean energy and the concept of building envelope to hold the spaces inside and food production is critical and you know this this is something that 
not everybody is talking about impervious pavers, you know. The reason why we lack water in a country na ang dami nating tubig tuwing umuulan is because we are closing off our grounds for the rainwater to penetrate dun sa ating aquifer, dun sa natural aquifer. You know, but if you can create, um, you know, pavers, yung imbis na concrete mo, gawin mo siyang purviews, no, and bring back the natural rainwater to where it should be, then malalesen natin yung pagbaba ng ating mga, um, ng, ng ating prop, ng ating lupa, di ba? Nagbumababa niyo yung ating uh, property, uh, ating uh, lupain, ano? Kasi no, na bumabagsak yung ating uh, water aquifer. And so um, we should also be designing for resiliency, as mentioned early, earlier, no? We are the fourth most vulnerable country in the whole world, no? we've experienced this, typhoon and all. So, paano gagawin natin kung halimbawa bumabagyo at may pandemia na naman yung baha, hindi makakupunta dun yung mga tao. So, how do we design for that? Importante, we work with urban planners and then we must be able to situate or locate our health uh, facilities in places na madaling maapot. And kung baha, um, dapat meron tayong ready, no? Helicopters and all that, no? Kasi, some people are saying, bakit napaka-social ng ating mga units na to dahil meron pang helipad? It's very critical because nga, we have to design based on our needs. No? Paano kung binahanga yung ating lugar? Dapat nakakarating din yung ating mga pasyente. And it had you know, as mentioned earlier, it has to be accessible by water. We should not also be designing only for buildings, but we have to design for the community as well. Location of your health facilities, very critical, Yan. Identifying the existing buildings or the old buildings that can work or that can um, uh, be used as health facility. Um, ginagawa natin yan ngayon, ano, yung mga hotels natin. No? Bago natin dalin sa hospital, dapat meron na rin tayong care about that. And I have seen, no, you have seen, I'm sure, how the how, how COVID vaccinations are being done. No? So we had some interviews with some LGUs, and a lot of them are doing those spaces, na elbow room lam, kahit sinasabi ng DOH at na World Health Organization na dapat um, six feet or more than a meter ang distancing, ang social distancing. Pero hindi na papatupad because, you know, Ang nagsa space plan nito should be professionals, no? Ang nangyayari dito, ang nagsa space plan are members of LGU na hindi sila um you know, they're, they're not familiar with uh spa with a, a regulated space planning or how do they even do that? Kailangan may mga traffic, one-way flow, etc. Et and we have to help them. So this was drafted together with the United Architects of the Philippines, itong COVID vaccination center planning guidelines. And so net zero, again, we are discussing about this, no? Um, this is how we should be designing in the future. We have a 2030-2050 target. Kasama tayo sa COP, kakatapos lang ng COP natin. May pangako tayo, may commitment ang Pilipinas na by 2030-50, meron tayong um, you know, um, tina-target na, na energy. We have to work with our government. And Climate Change Commission is working their best to, to, to give us inputs and we have to ask them, ano ba yung goal natin? Ano ang target? energy output na kailangan natin para maging mas efficient tayo so we'll be able to to reach that target because we have to address climate change no and so um with that in mind we have to be designing our buildings our cities and everything else um towards future zero carbon and just to end no, a, a few a few things lang we have to understand that um covid-19 is a much lesser problem compared to climate change no nagkaroon tayo ng recession and we know that this is a very very big problem to us to everyone lahat tayo apektado you know and so um if we can at least change our mindset no nagpalit tayo kasi ng mga systems natin every you know, from, from office work, nagkaroon tayo ng work from home, so many things, no, nag-adjust tayo, nag-adapt tayo. If we can do that, because we're seeing COVID as um, uh, an immediate death uh, situation, immediate life risk, no? Whereas yung climate change, medyo matagal eh. Kasi uh, ang COVID kasi, sa buong mundo nangyayari, everything is happening all at the same time. Pero ang climate change, pag bumagyo sa Tacloban, hindi naman bumagyo sa Metro Manila or hindi naman bumagyo sa US or sa Europe. So, hindi natin siya masyadong nafe-feel. No? So, for some people, uh, clim climate change is still uh, a concept. Parang hindi, mo, hindi ka makapush masyado. No? So, but, but we have to remember that if, we, if, if everyone, no? if all of us 
can um, prepare for climate change the way that we are preparing for COVID, then I'm sure we'll be able to handle things uh, very, very well. No? So we have to remember, again, you know, that um, uh, climate change, the mode of uh, transmission, sorry, the mode of transmission of uh, climate change is through the air. And we have to protect ourselves. We have, you know, masks and all. And um, I, I'm glad that uh, it was mentioned that integration of experts, no, uh, uh, has become, has been expressed, no, in many, uh, many instances. So um, transdisciplinary approach is something that we can um, use, no, in uh, addressing the pandemic. So with that, um, you know, uh, the message really is very clear for everyone. Ginamit na rin to ng lahat, one, you know, the word one, one word, and then uh, we unify because really we must be working as one. We have to unify and we have to create solutions, no? Hindi pwedeng, if I may say this, no? Ginagamit kasi to sa construction, excuse me for this word, but I, I just uh, recently talked to my engineer and said kasi nagpapataasan ng ihi, no? So, sino yung masikat? Ganyan. So, hindi dapat ganon. So, we work together and we can do this if we work as one. So, that's all. Um, Dr. Susie, back to you, Dr. Raymond. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, architect Louis Daya. Louis, thank you so much. You can see in the chat how much your talk has been appreciated. And uh, we, we are all feeling very enlightened by, by your insights. So, maraming salamat. No, maraming maraming salamat. Okay, so we are close to the top of the hour and uh, let's do our public service announcement and I'm going to ask our panelists to all open their videos. I don't know other cameras. I don't know if we have time for questions, but TVUP over to the PSA. Bye, po. Salamat po. Mama, bayad po. Ako, anak. Tabi mo na yan. Para masuklian ko ang mga sakripisyo niya sa taong bayan. Mapagbigay po kayo. Nakikita ko ang mahal na mahal ninyo ang inyong pamilya. Tama ka. Kaya nag-aalala ako. Paano ba matatapos itong pandemyang to? Para matapos, umpisahan na ninyo. Magpabakuna na kayo. ko kayo, magpapabakuna ako. Thank you so much, TVUP. The COVID Communication Public Service Announcement is one of the many outputs of the UP research entitled Communicating COVID-19 in Post-Quarantine Philippines. It's headed by the UP Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena Pernia, and funded by the Department of Science and Technology, PCHRD, and the Department of Health through the AHEAD HSPR project. Dr. Susie? Yeah, Raymond, I think we have time for only one question. So it's your choice, Raymond, what the question is. Well, there's this one question, which is I'm also interested po, no? Um, and I don't know if uh, any of our speakers will be able to uh, answer this. But uh, is there any incentive from any uh, international group or from the government for healthcare facilities and hospitals to go green, any certification uh, that they will need to undergo so that they're certified to be uh, as a green healthcare facility pot. Well, uh, if I may answer, Dr. Raymond, no? Go ahead. So, um, we have green building certifications ngayon, and these are all almost um kagustuhan ng administrasyon ng hospital, no? So, wala pang masyadong um, uh, rewards ngayon. Very konti if meron, ano? But ang, ang lagi namin sinasabi dito, ang panalo dito yung tao, no? So, if we are to do uh, green buildings, it has to be because not just of the patients, but because of the staff as well. Alam naman natin yung kakulangan natin ngayon ng mga medical uh, workforce, di ba? So, if we can, if we can give them a good place or, you know, ma mariretain natin din sila. So, um, um Meron na rin nga yung green building certifications ang tawag sa kanya ay well no it's focused really on the 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 health of uh of of uh, the building occupants okay unfortunately we don't have time for for, <laughs> for discussion i think we need a part 2 sabi no we're gonna anyway so uh let's see we're going to give our speakers a few minutes to just formulate their their parting words 
uh, while Raymond is going to answer the poll and then do the evaluation. Raymond, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Susie. As our panelists are uh, collecting themselves for their final messages to the audience, we'll go through the two uh, quizzes from the PON poll. Uh, first question, what should hospitals do to prepare for the pandemic? 91% um, of the respondents, so mga seven, of the 787 respondents chose all of the above. That's the correct answer po. Kailangan po natin lahat, effective and accessible leadership, constant review and revision of infection control and prevention protocols, healthcare worker restructuring, infra infrastructure redesign and restructuring. For the second question, Ano-ano po ang mga health facilities na pwedeng makatugon sa krisis ng pandemya? Again, ang tama sagot po dito is uh, all of the above, which is 77% of our attendees chose this. Uh, and we're very, very thankful for all of you who were able to join for our fun quiz. We'll also go straight to our evaluation poll. We hope that those who are still in the Zoom, 888 of you, will be able to um, uh, join in and answer the evaluation poll. Hindi po kami naglalabas ng separate na evaluation poll. Ito na po yun. And these are five questions answered uh, using a Likert scale. First question, the panelists demonstrated thorough knowledge of the topic. Number two, the panelists were well prepared and organized. Number three, the panelists spoke clearly and audibly. Number four, the panelists used appropriate language with technical medical jargons adequately explained. And number five, the panelists contributed to new perspectives and knowledge on managing various key COVID-19 health issues. We will not be closing the evaluation poll just yet as we move on to our final messages. Okay, so um, we just need a very short few sentences from you for our frontliners who, who have been with us today. And uh, what are your parting words? So we'll start with you. Oh, okay. Hold on. Oh, there. Okay. Um, well, the, the country is still battling COVID, no? Alam naman natin yan lahat, severely. And uh, we have a lot of limitations uh, in pandemic uh, preparedness. And I'm really glad that this, this is happening because we are helping our um, community, our our brothers and sisters to be prepared for the pandemic no but we have to speed uh, to speed our efforts no and we have to also make sure that if we're talking about uh, uh covid we also have if we're preparing for covid we also have to be to prepare no for for climate change kasi pagdating ng Malalakas, malalaking pandemia ulit, no? because of climate change related naman na pandemics, it's going to be very, very difficult. And so again, as, uh, as I mentioned kanina, battling COVID has required each of us to do our part. No? We changed our habits, um, nagkaroon tayo ng um, disinfecting of hands, we adjusted our lifestyles. So, you know, we made many uh, personal sacrifices and uh, if we can do this in our homes, because our homes can also be health facilities, and uh, para hindi natin maklog no yung uh, yung hospital system, we have to do this, and we have to take a part our, our part no, especially tayo. We are influencers here, if I must say, because we are we are being heard no. So if we can tell everyone to to tama yon, mag, 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 mag vaccine tayo, and we have to um, plan our building facilities very well, then matutulungan natin lahat directly or indirectly sa, sa pandemics na ito. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Architect Louie. Okay, let's go to Dennis. Dr. Dennis, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Susie. I, you know, we've learned a lot over the past two years of this pandemic and we still continue to learn every day. So I just enjoin everyone to keep on listening to the experts, follow the advice of, of our experts, and let's, let's just cooperate to, in order to end this pandemic once and for all. Thank you very much, Dennis. Gap? Well, paulit-ulit kong sinasabi, I'd just like to repeat again the four lessons that I have personally learned from this pandemic. Fight the fear, believe in good science, never let your guard down, and let's take care of each other. Thank you very Thank much, Susie. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gapli Gaspi of the Philippine General Hospital. Okay, so just to close, I'm not going to give a long summary. I just wanted to say that today we spent some time thinking about what we're going to do in the future. And um, PGH has shown us their, their plans, which look very feasible to address uh, disruption of services for non-COVID patients, the anxiety of health workers, confusion about patients where to go, and the need to just overall improve our health facilities. So they've shown how engineering 
uh, innovations and design can be applied now so that in the future, hindi tayo magkahagan ito. Um, Dennis Serrano of St. Luke's also talked about all the issues, especially around uh, traffic inside the hospitals. No? How do you use? How do you change? How do you, uh, how do you uh, retrofit? How do you become flexible and adaptive? And so I think um, the, the, the main message was that it's not just the public hospitals, but even private hospitals that are well-resourced have to deal with this. And of course, uh, Louis walked us through uh, design, smart design, climate, uh, sort of climate resilient architecture. And uh, I would say that, and I've seen this in some of the literature that whatever we're doing for COVID is actually good for climate change. So we have to, the, the same response that we have for COVID is the response we're going to have to have for climate change. And just as on a little note, right, uh, we are supposed to, work together so that surface temperature of the earth will not go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, in July 2021, it was already 1.6 degrees Celsius. So yung sinasabing, hindi kami nananakot when we're saying that there's something more that's coming, but uh, this, is, this is based on the science. So it, it was a great, I think a great webinar for, for me. I felt that I... I learned a lot and I'm very inspired by our speakers and I'd just like to thank you and our audience for being with us today. So over to you, Raymond. Thank you, Dr. Susie. For those who are asking, we will be collecting all of the questions that we have in the Q&A and also in the chat and we will be relaying them to our experts and then aggregating all of the answers and posting them later on. Uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank our really our excellent uh, panel of experts for today. Not, not uh, every day that we're able to uh, be graced with their expertise and their presence and really uh, be able to learn from the, and from the nuggets of wisdom that they have shared, uh, from, not just from the health sector, but from, uh, from, from a more holistic perspective for using the systems approach. Very, very important to note that um, teamwork is uh, critical. A collaborative approach is necessary for us to be able to get out of this pandemic. So maraming maraming salamat po, Director Gap Legaspi of the Philippine General Hospital, Director Dennis Sorano of the St. Luke's Medical Center, and Architect Louis Daya Garcia uh, of the Green Architects. Maraming maraming salamat po. You will see in the chat how you're well received and well loved and they really are very much receptive to all of the uh, knowledge that you have imparted. Maraming maraming salamat din po sa uh, lahat po ng uh, ating mga nakidalo sa ating webinar for today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the very hardworking team behind the Stop COVID That's webinar series. Without each and every one of you, we'll not be able to provide this quality content, we, content week in and week out po. So maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. And finally, all Stop COVID That's webinars, uh, 77 na po, no? and will be 78 right after this webinar are archived for viewing at the TVUP YouTube channel. So please uh, feel free to watch them on the playback. Kahit ano man po ito, I will, uh, we will be especially um, highly recommending this webinar just because it's something that encompasses uh, not just the work but also in your home if you're looking into uh, incorporating any of the recommendations by our experts. So this formally closes our webinar for this week. Uh, next week po, ma maganda po ang ating pag-uusapan. Uh, it's not uh, something that uh, we have been uh, talking about uh, probably more more consistently and more often than uh, how how we should be doing it. But uh, we are lo really looking forward, uh, at least for our experts, uh, to join us for next week. Uh, and this will be about COVID-19 te testing. We look forward to your company again. Next week, same time, same channel po from 12 noon uh, to 2 p.m. Every Friday, uh, let's make this our regular fri Friday lunch date. Lahat po ng inyong mga kasamahan, sana po ay maka-join na po sa ating Zoom webinar. Uh, lalo na po yung mga nag-watch party po either in uh, sa Facebook at sa YouTube po. Sana po makapasok na po sa Zoom for next week. Uh, maraming maraming salamat po. Makita-kita po tayo ulit. It's a day. Okay, thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, next week, as Raymond said, it's about COVID testing. Ano bang mga bago sa COVID testing? 
magpapatest ka ba kung na-vaccinate ka na? Meron ka bang, ano, parang, uh, meron bang testing na dapat gawin pagkatapos mabakunahan? Ano ba yung antigen test? We will talk about all things related to new forms of testing. And uh, we'll see you next week. So together, we can stop COVID deaths. So keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online! The enemy remains unseen I'll keep your hand in mine Let's say a prayer one more time I know you long for home But I am here, you're not alone I'll stay with you until the coast is clear The others pain before my fears The others lives before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask Do I have strength to carry on? Oh God, how long will this go on? I need you here to keep me strong I'm here to hold the line I'll keep my head Until my Hold on to the word he gave This time will come to pass Cause this salvation's made to last He'll carry you to see the break of day The others pain before my fears The others vows before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask Do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong I'm here to hold the line I'll keep my head wet Until my head dies From my fears, the others laugh before my tears, but right behind the mask, I look into myself and ask, Do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong, I'll keep my word, you would as mine. The others pain from my fears. Pushing on the spine of tears Please take us through another day Just hold my hand And I will hold the line I will hold